I could be in the deepest valley I could be in a broken place Pushing past all the many distractions I'll make my way to a place of praise Then I'll find my way to a place of praise Where your glory dwells and my hope remains When I'm in that place, all within me comes alive My soul, arise and sing Spirit of God overflow in me May this song of joy be my offering to you Then I find my way to a place of praise Where your glory dwells and my hope remains When I'm in that place all within me comes alive All written out my praise with all I have All written out my praise with every breath Bless your heart Then I find my way To a place of praise Where your glory dwells And my hope remains When I'm in that place All within me comes alive Then I find my way to a place of praise where your glory dwells and my hope remains. When I'm in that place, all within me comes to life. I come alive. I come alive. I come alive. Good morning. Good morning. Great to see you this morning. Good morning. Well, we're glad you're here. Happy New Year to you all. Happy New Year. Whether you're watching this live or whether you're watching this back, we do want to wish you a happy New Year. As we commence a new year, we take this opportunity to come before God in worship, in prayer, and to open God's word together too. It's great uh, and a great opportunity for us this morning to commit our lives afresh to the Lord. We'd want to be, be doing that today. And to say thank you to God for his faithfulness to us, right? He's been a faithful God. Even throughout 2021, as we commence a new year, we reflect on God's faithfulness to us over the last year. Some of you will have had difficulties this year, maybe challenges. Some of you will have had triumphs. And this is an opportunity also where people start things, they stop things. People look at uh, starting new resolutions for the year. Um, but as we move into worship, I'm reminded this morning that God is the beginning and the end of all things. The Bible records him as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end in Revelation 22, 13. But whatever this year has in store for each of us, I take great comfort in knowing that our all-knowing and all-powerful God has us in the palm of his hands. Amen. He's faithful and he'll continue to be faithful. Why don't you stand? We're going to worship the Lord together. As you're standing, um, just to note, please pray for Matt. Matt's not very well. He's not going to be with us this morning. Um, sadly, he's not been well over the last week, and we do need to remember him in prayer. He's recovering. He's getting better. But let's remember him in our prayers, please. That'd be good to do that. Great. Let's sing together 10,000 Reasons. <laughs> Oh, my soul, I wish you. 
of God. Let's sing his praise one more time. Let's sing, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul. I'll worship your holy Lord, I worship your holy name. Lord, I worship your holy
Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life.
goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath Dave just keeps playing. Let's just take a minute to think about God's faithfulness to us over the last year. There'll be things that you'll be able to think about, things that you'll be able to pinpoint where you think, God, you were really faithful to me in that moment. Just take a minute just to reflect on those moments this year where you think, actually, God, yeah, you were really faithful there. You might want to close your eyes, bow your heads, just to take a minute to do that. Every breath 
that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Yes, I will sing of the goodness of God Lord, in this moment right now, we pour back to you in praise with thankful hearts. Lord, what a joy and a privilege it is to be able to stand together as your church, gathered together, to pour out our praise before you with thankful hearts, hearts filled with gratitude. We say thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take your seats just for a moment. Great. It's so good to spend some time in praise and worship as we start a new year, to take time to wait in God's presence and to be thankful this morning. Now, some of you will already be aware that the sad loss of our beloved Gordon has meant that as a staff team, we've been a person down over the last 12 months or so. Now, our long-term aim is to look for someone to come and support the team in the role of the associate pastor. But we don't want to make any rushed decisions around that. But whilst we take time to look at staffing requirements, there's also a need for support over the next 12 months, over this little while, this short uh, 12-month period. So over the last few months, the deacons and the elders within the church have been giving prayerful consideration as to who could come and provide that support over the coming months. And the leadership of the church concluded, rightly, that it would be good for us to approach Colin Clark, who is currently serving as a volunteer in the church. Many of you will know him. He's preached before. He's known to us as a church. He's been involved in the discipleship group and leading communion and uh, done all sorts of stuff as a volunteer leader within the church. So Colin was approached to see if he would be interested in helping on a part-time basis. And then subsequent meetings took place between Colin, Matt, and Daphne, Colin's wife, uh, and also Steve Reynolds, one of the elders within the church on behalf of the leadership team. And we're really pleased to say that Colin felt this same sense of God's leading. Colin has a desire to serve God here at Tesswood in this place. And he's happy to do that on a more formal basis basis, albeit on a fixed term. Colin has a wide range of experience and it was strongly felt that he would be brilliantly placed to come and provide that support and help to the team uh, during this short period. Colin's great at preaching, uh, he loves God's word, he has a passion for the Lord and that certainly comes across when he brings God's word to us. Collins previously studied at Moreland's Bible College and has served and led in a number of different churches, including the Brethren Church, the Baptist Church, and the community in in the community as well. And serving alongside London City Mission Team based in East London. And since his retirement, he's kept busy, I tell you. This man does a heck of a lot. And so he's also served um, overseas um, with some overseas projects, both in places like India and in Romania as well. So Colin comes with a wealth of experience and we're really pleased that he's going to be be joining us on the staff team for one year. We can put our hands together. That would be really good for us to do that. So Colin's going to be contracted to the role of assistant pastor for 20 hours a week and his responsibilities would include the oversight of small groups and the the pastoral team working alongside Megan Murray, which is really great. So Colin, we're really excited to have you come on board with us as a staff team. It's a great privilege for us that you're joining us. Um, Actually, Colin, why don't you come and join me? We'd we'd like to pray for Colin as he comes. Great. Um, Before we pray, Colin, you've got a mic on already. Great, brilliant, fantastic. Tell us a little bit about yourself, just briefly. Oh, it's very difficult to encapsulate uh, lots of stuff that's happened over the years. Um, But Daphne and I have been in full-time Christian ministry since 1971. We were married in August 71. And uh, so we we set off on this uh, journey of Christian service at that particular time that summer. And 
Well, you've given a, a little bit of a, a, a summary <laughs> of the stuff. Yeah. Started off as an itinerant evangelist, doing a lot of children's missions, that sort of thing, with, I don't know, children's missions of a couple of hundred kids at a time, and, and then doing miss, uh, youth missions, etc., and eventually transitioning into pastoral work. That's great. The thing I know about Colin is he's a very humble man, and he's always saying to the Lord, what is it that you want me to learn? <laughs> Where can I grow? How yeah. can I serve? Yeah. And that sort of heart, just that heart of humility is a real blessing to watch and just a great um, witness to me as a young minister growing in my role so thank you Colin for that um, what are you most excited about about this role embarking on this year I think there's all sorts of things and what one thing came to mind particularly because I, I was um, I, I was given these questions a couple of days ago by the way so I got a little bit of an idea and many exciting things possible but there's one particular thing in my mind is in the support of the team that is here. It's such a privilege to be part of those. Great. And my mind went back to, sorry about, the problem is with old people, they reminisce, so apologies for that. But I was a 23-year-old, 24-year-old young evangelist going to the evangelist conference at High Lee that was always organized by the Evangelical Alliance. And having coffee uh, at one of the breaks, and you've got all these big evangelist that, uh, you know, would preach to thousands of people. And here's me just starting as a 23-year-old, 24-year-old. And having coffee, an evangelist came up to me and started to chat to me and said, you know, what's your name, Colin Clark? I know who you are. I read the magazine of the organization that you're, you're a staff evangelist for. Yeah. This guy, his name was Dr. Uh, Alan Redpath. At that time, he was a very well-known evangelist, Bible teacher, and pastor. And he chatted to me and just encouraged me in, in the ministry. I was just starting out. He was sort of, well, he wasn't exactly coming to the end of his journey, but he had such a history of God using him. And I just think about the, the, the things that I'm being asked to do here or yeah. uh, called to do. And... It's my privilege to be able to, in some way, help guys like you and others in the team. Uh, if I can help and support and encourage and see things grow, and then I'll just fade into the background. <laughs> People won't remember me. I'm sure that's uh, not they, true. They won't me. But I, I know from experience that's true. Okay. That when, you, when you finish in a place, people forget, well, what was his name? Can't remember. But hey... See, I told you, he's a very humble, humble man, isn't he? Yeah, it's great. Thanks, Colin. That's super. What can we be praying for? For you, of course, but also for you and Daphne as a couple. Some specific things that come to mind. I think particularly, I mean, given the fact that theoretically we retired nearly eight years ago, um, <laughs> we're enjoying retirement. Sure. Uh, and now we're sort of for a year coming out of that situation, it's yeah. going to be so very different. And I think we'd value prayer in that regard. Yeah. Uh, and also that in some way through our ministry this year, yeah. we would leave a trace of God's presence yeah. on the fellowship here. You'll forget us. Uh, we'll go on and whatever. Um, but if only as a result of our, our time spent with you, that you have a sense increasingly of the presence of God yeah. that, that's, that would be my prayer thank you, brilliant mm. Great. Well, I'm going to invite you to stand as you're able to join me in standing and I'm going to invite Ray's going to come as a member of the leadership as an elder within the church here and we're going to pray for Colin and I'm going to invite you if you feel comfortable to do this, just, just stretch out your hand it's a symbolic thing, it says we're with you Colin and I think it's important but also it says we're, we're in agreement with this prayer so stretch your hand out and we're going to pray Bless for Colin right now thank you Lord, we do thank you for Colin, for bringing him and Daphne to Testwood. Mm -hmm. Father, I thank you for Colin's passion for your word and his passion mm -hmm. to see your kingdom come here in this town in Testwood, mm -hmm. in Totten. Lord, as he picks up these areas of responsibility, would you fill him afresh with the power of your spirit that he may know the sensing and the prompting and guiding of your spirit in him? Lord, would you give him your words as he prepares to preach, as he prepares to meet with people, Lord, would you give him great wisdom? Mm -hmm. And I pray that both the fruit and the gifts of the Spirit will be ever so evident in his ministry. Mm 
as he serves you here in this place, I pray. Mm. Amen. 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 Father God, we, we thank you for, for Colin and for Daphne. We thank you for the people you created them to be, the gifts you've given them, the, the ministry journey that you've taken them on, the way that they have, have faithfully and, and humbly served you over many, many years. And Father, we, we thank you for their willingness to, to take on this role here with us over this next year. Father, we, we pray, as, as Colin asked, that, we, that as they come, in a sense, out of retirement into a slightly more formal role, that that transition will be one that will be easy. It will be a transition that brings great joy uh, and, and great enlivening of their spirits and of, of them mm. as people, mm. as they, as they ser serve you and see and feel your leading mm. and guiding over yeah. this time. Father, we, we pray that, exactly as Colin asked, that what will be left will be a sense of you. Mm. Yeah. Father, we pray for us as church that we might gain more understanding of you mm. and a greater experience of you in all that we do. And Father, we thank you for the part that Colin and Daphne will play mm. in that process. Father, may they fit really easily and smoothly into a staff team. Mm. Father, may they be a blessing to that team and may the team be a blessing to them. Mm. May we as church experience your blessing mm. as a result of this appointment because we ask it in your name. Amen. 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 Thanks so much, Colin and Ray. Bless you. Let's give uh, Colin a round of applause, Sharid, as he goes back to seat. Great. We're going to stay in this attitude of prayer um, just a little while longer as we pray for our year ahead. As we embark on a new year, it's important that we commit this year to the Lord in prayer. So we're going to do that. So I'm going to invite you to join me as we pray together. We're going to use the PRAY an acronym because it's a really helpful sort of structure that helps to lead us through as we pray together. So the first letter is the letter P. And for us, it's going to stand for pause. Psalm 46 and verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Let's take some time right now in the quiet just to be still before the Lord, just to spend time in his presence. Lord, I'm reminded this morning of the story of Elijah. When Elijah was on the mountainside, God, you weren't in the fire, you weren't in the earthquake or in the winds, but Lord, you came in a still small voice, in a whisper. Lord, I pray this year, would you help us to hear that whisper, to hear that still small voice that says, come, come and spend time with me, come and wait in my presence. Help us, Lord, to hear that still small voice. And the R stands for rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. You'll have heard this in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. As we start in a new year, we rejoice in you, Lord Jesus. We rejoice in who you are, the love that you have for each and every one of us, the grace you so freely give. And as we come to the end of this Christmas period, we rejoice as we reflect on all that you did for us. The reminder of the Christmas story is a reminder about how you see each and every one of us, that you love us, that you want to be where we are, that you want to spend time with us, and we thank you for that this morning. We rejoice because you gave so much so that we might be in a relationship with you. But we also rejoice because of our church, the people. We rejoice that we're able to gather together in this place, to be in community with one another. And I thank you, Lord, that even when we feel alone, 
We're reminded through your word that you are so close to each one of us. Lord, help us to be close to each other too. Help us to look forward this year with a sense of rejoicing in you, I pray. Amen. Amen. And the A stands for ask. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you hear our prayers. Today, Lord, as we stand before you, we know that there are all sorts of things going on in our lives, things that we'd want to bring to you. Thank you that we can come before you. Yes, you're a king, but you're also a great father who knows how to give good gifts. We thank you that that's true of your nature, Lord. Let's take a moment right now just to think about those things that are on our hearts that we'd want to bring to the Lord as we start a new year. What are those things that are on your hearts? Thank you, Lord, that you've heard every single prayer. And the Y stands for yield. Romans 12 and verse 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Lord, as we come before you in this new year, we surrender to you again. Lord, we have a desire to follow you. And our prayer is that wherever you're leading us, whatever you're asking us to do, Lord, may we be a faithful people. We pray this as individuals in our own hearts, but we pray this corporately as a church too. Help us to follow you, to be faithful, to go where you're asking us to go. And Lord, I pray that you would help us not to allow the doubts and fears to step over the yes and amen response the yes and amen in you, in Christ. Lord, would you open our eyes and our hearts to what it is that you want us to do this year. Help us to catch your vision, Lord. We commit all this to you in your precious name. Amen. 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 I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to, oh, Sarah, sorry. We're going to sing in a second, but Sarah's going to come. Yeah, um, children, we're going to go out to the back now. Well done. You've prayed with us as a church beautifully. Fantastic. We're going to go out now to the back um, and we're going to meet in the youth bar. So the first room we go in as we go upstairs. We're all going to go upstairs and we'll meet in the youth bar. Okay. Cool. Let's stand together as well. We're going to continue our song worship. We're going to sing Promises. God of covenant, our faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven that you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast and let my heart learn when you speak up. It will come to pass Great is your faithfulness to me Great is your faithfulness to me From the rising sun to the setting same I will pray
from age to age Though the earth may pass away Your word remains the same Your history can prove There's nothing you can't do You're faithful and true Though the storms may Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness to each and every one of us. Lord, we thank you that your word is solid, it's firm. Lord, it's a foundation for our lives. 
And Lord, we thank you as we hear your word time and time again, Lord, that it produces something in our lives. Lord, we do pray for Colin right now as he comes to bring your word. We thank you for him, for your servant. Lord, would you bless the words that he's prepared. And Lord, may our hearts be ready to receive your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats. Do you know, I, I really count it a privilege to be invited to join the team here. Over these last, I guess Daphne and I have been attending here and then in membership for the last, what, five, six years, something like that. And uh, I've all that time looked with admiration and excitement as I've seen the team that has come together under Gordon's leadership over those years, and I, I'm just stunned that we were, we were here at church a few weeks ago, back in the beginning of November, something like that, and uh, we were here for a meeting, and um, Matt said to Daphne and me, would you come up to the office? I want to have a word with you. It was reminiscent of when I was at school. <laughs> Um, and here we are, and it's just such a privilege and, uh, to be able to serve in this way. In fact, um, as some of you will know, I was on the little panel that uh, looked into the possibility of Matt becoming the senior pastor, and in his presentation, he talked about getting somebody um, to come with more senior years to give some additional help and somebody turned to me in that room and said Colin that's you and I said no way there is absolute I'm done I'm done God has a sense of humor and uh, a number of years ago Daphne and I were uh, at a conference a Christian conference over in America and uh, listening to one of the the Bible teachers and came up with this lovely little expression very English if you ain't dead, you ain't done. <laughs> and uh, there's something of that in it. Anyway, privilege to be with you. And uh, thank you for your patience. And uh, I'm sure you'll need some more patience during the year. Uh, but uh, thank you so much. It's very, a great privilege. You know, when we come to the beginning of a new year, um, and particularly uh, given the experience of this last year or these last couple of years, I'm sure we have a kind of a mixture of all sorts of emotions of fear and uncertainty and so on. And, and I suppose the, the ideal attitude that one should have as you approach a new year is to have that element of hope and optimism. And I guess given the circumstances that are behind us, um, it's difficult, isn't it, to be overly optimistic. And I'm sure there are many worries that we have. It was a few weeks ago, actually, that Matt came to me and said, or, or in fact, I, I think he rang me and said, Colin, will you do me a favor? I'm beginning to discover when my mobile rings and I see it's Matt Huckle, I, I sort of think, uh-uh, what's happening? Would you do me a favor? Would you preach on the first Sunday of the new year? I said, fine, that's okay. I, you know, he said, the rest of the team, all of us are going to be extremely tired, and it would be go good to have you, a retired old man. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> but would you, would you preach on the new year? And, you know, almost immediately, having said, yes, I would do it, almost immediately a certain phrase came into my mind, and it was this. This hope is an anchor for your soul. This hope is an anchor for your soul. Interestingly, when I thought about that and when that came to my mind, I had completely forgotten that you had been going through a series on the subject of hope. Hope has a name. I'd completely forgotten it. Reason being that the previous four weeks, I'd been away preaching elsewhere. 
And when I started to think it through, this phrase, the hope, uh, this hope is an anchor for the soul, and I suddenly realized that actually it's tagging on to the, the pre-Christmas messages, I thought, thank you, Lord. Thank you. And so I turn to that uh, uh, scripture in Hebrews 6, which says this, We who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. An anchor for our souls. I don't know whether many of you have been watching uh, a series of programs on the television called Saving Lives at Sea. Um, Daphne and I, we'd heard about it but hadn't watched it at all and then we started watching it and then we record it when it comes on. Fascinating program about the work of the RNLI, the, uh, the lifeboat folk, the volunteers there. And it's a fascinating uh, story where week by week they give particular accounts of certain disasters or difficult situations that people have found themselves in. Things like paddle boarders blown off course, unexpected and dangerous currents sweeping people away, walkers caught out by the tide, quicksand sucking you down, engine failure in a bar large boat, and so on. Every situation where the person was taken by surprise and they were unprepared for a difficult situation. And it's in those circumstances that the lifeboat folk are called out in desperate situations. And I don't know about you, I don't know whether any of you suffer from seasickness. I'm sure you do, uh, many of you from time to time. And, and, and when you're watching that program and you're seeing the boat going up and, uh, you know, and you think, oh my word, I'm feeling bad just sitting on the settee, let alone being in a boat. But each of those very desperate situations and at the end of it, of course, the, the, the producers of, of the program sort of ramp up the, the tension so that at the end of it, yes, certainly lives have been saved. But nonetheless, those folks in difficult situations. When we come to the beginning of this new year, I was wrestling myself in, in, in a sense with, should I mention the events of the last two years? Because to be perfectly honest, I'm fed up hearing about it. I'm fed up. I don't want to see it on the TV. I turn off the news now. But the problem is, it seems to me, that that in turn becomes kind of the elephant in the room. It would be inappropriate almost to, to go into the new year and completely ignore the events that have happened during these past couple of years. Because it's as if we have been in the middle of a never-ending storm and we can't see the calm. There is no safe harbor. There is no solid ground. And there are constantly changing currents so that we don't know what's going to happen next. We haven't got a clue. There's all kinds of speculations going on. But some of the things that have happened during this past year and even be, be before that, so many things have caught us out. Quicksands, changing currents, engine failure, call it what you will. But our foundations have been shaken to the core. Most of the plans that we made have been disrupted at some level. This last year was Daphne's and my golden wedding, and we were going to go over to New England for a couple of weeks. Hey-ho, never mind. Uh, couldn't happen. Hopefully, maybe later this year. Many are living in fear at some level, some more than others. Some of my friends are talking with them on the phone or FaceTiming them, have been absolutely paranoid, terrified as to what, what's been going on. Relationships have been broken because of differences of opinion over all the events that have taken place. We don't know who to trust or who to believe in. Our trust in material things has been challenged. I've got all these things, whatever they happen to be, X amount in the bank, maybe diminishing, but X amount in the bank, got all these material things, but in the context of what's been happening, what is it worth? 
work life has been thrown into chaos. The list is absolutely endless of all that has gone on. And here at TBC, we have been introduced to a new understanding of the word hope. And that hope, that the word hope has been introduced particularly in the context of the Christmas message. That great expectation that the Savior is coming. Not something vague or uncertain. The prophets spoke about it and every one of those prophecies was kept. How many times, for example, in Christmas services where we listen to the, uh, th those familiar Old Testament scriptures about a child being born, about Bethlehem and so on and so forth. Even the events in history build up towards the event of Christmas. In the dim and distant past, when I was one of those prehistoric people that went to Moreland's College when it was residing down in Devon, that was in the 60s, I remember a lecture that we had at that time about the way that the whole of history, let alone all the biblical prophecies, the whole of history was converging on the events of the birth of Christ. That's a story for another time, but uh, incredible how that all happened. God kept his word. The Savior was born. The hope was fulfilled. The promise kept. But what I want to do in these few moments I have this morning is to take one more step as we uh, move into an uncertain new year. And talk about an anchor for the soul. An anchor for the soul. You know, I'm sure many of us during the course of this particular time, these last couple of years, have begun to reevaluate so many of life's priorities. We've begun to look at things in a new way. What do I value most? What or who is most important to, to me? What actually can I live without? What is life all about? You know, the writer to the Ecclesiastes, we believe it was Solomon, the writer to the Ecclesiastes in chapter 3 wrote these words, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. I don't know how many times I will have read that at a funeral service. Time to be born, time to die, etc., etc. In fact, th th those words were popularized in a song uh, in the charts in the 60s, Turn, Turn, Turn. Uh, the older folks will remember it. But that passage in Ecclesiastes 3 goes on, and it says this in verse 11 of the chapter, God has planted eternity in the human heart. God has planted eternity in the human heart. In other words, what the writer was saying is this. There is an eternal dimension to life. There is more to life than just the here and now. And when the here and now is taken from us or is undermined, what are we actually left with? All that sort of stuff. In fact, Jesus told the story, and I'm sure many will be familiar with this story. It's in Luke chapter 12. He told the story of a successful farmer. And the farmer, year on year, produced a bigger harvest. And as he produced a bigger harvest, so he built bigger barns. And as he built bigger barns, so the harvest grew. And so he pulled down the old barns and built bigger ones. And Jesus went on in that story. Where in the, towards the conclusion of the story, oh, well, well, let me just backtrack for a moment. The farmer, he, his attitude was, now I, we can eat, drink and be merry. We're going to have a wonderful time. The barns are full. We've got everything. And then as Jesus told the story, in the older version of the Bible, the King James Version, it says this, you fool, this night your soul will be required of you. This night, your, your soul will be required of you. Or you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you have worked for? Remember hearing of uh, a wake at a funeral 
where you know people are having their cup of tea or glass of wine or whatever it is and chatting together. And the question was asked, how much did he leave? How much did he leave? And the response was, everything. Everything. You ain't taking it with you. There is an eternal dimension to life. There is more to it than we can see and touch. And you know, the New Testament writers gives us, give us some pointers to this. And it says this, Paul says this in 2 Corinthians, so we don't look at the troubles we can see now, rather we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen, for the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. You know, a number of times, Daphne and I live in Bransgore. Some people think we're mad coming over here uh, to church, 20 miles. Um, our, our son, who's a pastor, uh, he has a little phrase that I'm sure he nicked from somebody else. Um, but it's this, if the church is alive, it's worth a drive. Uh, <laughs> So Daph and I, we, we drive over from Bransgore and, and, and come and worship here. But you know, there's been many an occasion that I've stood at the bottom of our garden, and it's not massive, but it's a reasonable size garden, and I, start, uh, I look at the house from the bottom of our garden, and I think to myself, and I say to myself, we're tenants. Somebody else is going to live in this sometime. It's not ours forever and ever. It will go eventually. And so the, 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 the writer to the, uh, or the, of Ecclesiastes emphasized the point, God has set eternity in our heart. There is another dimension to life. And if we take this a little further and we, we have another quote that brings out the, the truth of this, that Peter writing, he says this, in his great mercy, God has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. I can't tell you the number of times that I've read that passage at a funeral service and how blessed I have been in taking such a service when the person that we're saying farewell to has been a Christ follower. Just this last year, I can't remember the date exactly, but I, I was coming down to make the cup of tea in the morning and looked at my phone as I do. I, I'm told that you're not supposed to do that really, but anyway I do. And I looked at my phone and there was a message from our friends in India in Bangalore. But a very good friend there, a guy called Murali, who caught COVID and had died. What a lovely Christian man. We've met him on a number of occasions when we've been out there uh, for ministry and so on. And the message was that he had just died that morning. And his funeral service would be online. And so I, I took my computer, I went up into the study, and I watched for the next couple of hours or so as they had managed to do a live stream into the cemetery. And you will have seen on news programs, of, it was when it was really bad in India, and there were body bags everywhere and so on. And I watched as... Our friend Murali, in a blue body bag, was brought to the graveside, and the pastor, covered from head to toe, you couldn't even see his eyes. And it was such a moving moment, and the tears were running down my cheeks as I sat at my desk watching that service. But do you know, as I listened to the pastor there reading scripture, and putting things in context, I don't think I have ever quite had such a, a sense of the reality and the wonder of God's promise in Christ because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 
I just had that sense that our friend Murali, as he was laid in that hole in the ground, had to be quick because there were many others to be laid to rest as well. That what Peter wrote there, by his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Do you know the message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is essential in all of this? The fact that Jesus is alive means that we have a hope. And whatever happens this year, nothing but nothing will take that hope away. Because it is secure, because Jesus is alive. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have entrusted your life to him, you've come to him for forgiveness of sin and to be made new, your home is in heaven. It doesn't matter whether your home is in Bransgore or Tottenham or wherever it happens to be. That's just bricks and mortar. You can't take it with you. But here you have on the promise of God's word, a home in heaven. What an anchor of the soul. What an anchor of the soul. This certain hope is a life in relationship with God. Eternal life. It starts now and goes on into eternity. You want to go forward with hope in 2022? Read again 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. A living hope, a living hope. But I want to tell you about another aspect to this anchor, a certain hope. And it's this. You know, during the course of Jesus' ministry, he started to speak about his return. This was all pre the cross, the resurrection, the ascension. It's all pre, pre, pre that. We have just come through Christmas and celebrated and we've remembered those lovely scriptures. Unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, a virgin shall conceive, a bear a son. Bethlehem, out of you will come a ruler, etc. To you is born a saviour, Christ the Lord. All that sort of stuff. Great promises. And we have celebrated that God kept his word, every last one of them. Even down to the details of the cross. They divided their garments among them. They pierced my hands and my feet. All those promises, those pro pro prophecies concerning uh, the, 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 the coming and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, every last one was kept, every last one. And Jesus started to talk about his return. He started to talk about the climax of the ages. And he encouraged or challenged his followers to watch for the signs of the times. What is going to happen as a prelude to his return? He talked, for example, about wars and rumors of wars. He talked about famine and earthquakes. And Luke's record adds plagues. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? And also Jesus said, or the scripture says, that he will come as a thief in the night. When you are least expecting it. The thief that is going to burgle your house will not send you a text message to say, I'm coming tonight. He'll just turn up. Because you weren't ready. You weren't expecting it. And so it was following Jesus' resurrection on the Mount of Olives as he was about to ascend in heaven, or indeed he ascended into heaven, and the angels came and, and, and stood with the disciples as they were gazing into heaven and wondering, how's that happened? What's going on? And this is what they said. 
Men of Galilee, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. This same Jesus will come again. God kept every promise of his word concerning the coming of the Savior first time round. By the law of averages, he will be coming back anytime, anytime soon, anytime soon. And we may wonder what the future holds, but one certainty is this, that Jesus is returning and the signs point to his coming just as they did the first time around. And friends, this hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. What an anchor for our souls. I want to conclude with a story some of you may well have heard. Forgive me if you've heard it before, but I find it just so significant in the context of the storms that we have been through and the uncertainties for the future. In the late 19th century, an American lawyer, his name was Horatio Spafford. He was a committed Christian. Uh, he was, uh, must have been a very wealthy businessman. He was a lawyer. He owned a lot of property in the city of Chicago. And he was a great supporter of the American evangelist D.L. Moody. Great missions that Moody had, uh, both in America and over here in the UK. A an incredible evangelist. And Horatio Spafford had a series of tragedies. First of all, he, he, he had five children. One little boy and four girls. His little boy contracted, I think it was scarlet fever. And at the age of four, died. Heartache, wow. What heartache? Losing your little one. And then, around about the same time, in fact, I think it was about two years after, Chicago had an amazing fire. A fire that destroyed loads of property, lot of loss of life, and so on. And Spafford lost all his property in the fire. The whole lot. Everything had gone absolutely pear-shaped. And so he came to the point and talking with his wife and his four surviving girls, said, look, Mr. Moody is going over to the UK, to Europe. It would be good, Let's, look, we, we'll take a break. We, we've had a hard time, we've lost a little one. Uh, our, our, our property has been destroyed. We'll go and, and support Mr. Moody on his, some of his missions in the UK. And so he arranged, he booked the passage and so on. And then some business stuff came up, so he had to stay behind. And he said to his wife and his children, you go on ahead and I'll, meet, I'll come on, on the, as soon as I've done the business that I need to. And their boat set off across the Atlantic. In the middle of the Atlantic, there was a collision. And the boat that Mrs. Spafford and her four girls were on uh, sank within 12 minutes with the loss of 300 lives. Obviously, Horatio didn't know what was going on at this particular time, but eventually his wife managed to reach, or she managed to survive as she got to, uh, to South Wales, to Cardiff. And she sent a telegraph message back to her husband with just two words, saved alone. The four girls were lost at sea, and it was just his wife that was saved. Broken-hearted Horatio Spafford decided to get on the next boat as soon as he could to cross the Atlantic. And as they, they were crossing the Atlantic, the captain of the ship that he was sailing on 
called him, knowing something of his story, called him up to the deck and, and, and told him, we are about to pass over where your wife's ship went down. And the Horatio went back to his cabin. And as he contemplated all of that, he started to write a lovely hymn. When peace, like a river, attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. You know, we face challenging times in the new year. It's been a tough time already. But we face challenging times in the new year. But God has given us an anchor for our soul. He has given us a certain hope. There is not only life beyond the grave. There is not, a, not just life here and now. There is an eternal dimension to it. He has given us the assurance of that eternal dimension to life. But he has also given us the assurance that Jesus will come back. He's on his way. He's on his way. I'm sorry, it's just a little thought come to my mind. It's a good friend of mine that I had at Moreland's. He was a great, he is a great evangelist. And he's been lying flat on his back with MND for the last two years. He always used to write to me when we were serving as evangelists in different parts of the country. Poor Cole now, his name's Colin as well, Colin Holmes. And he always, at the bottom of his letter, put K-L-U. Keep looking up. Keep looking up. We have a certain hope. And I just kind of ask the question, where do you put your trust? Because God, through Christ, has given us an anchor for our soul through the most difficult of times. It's sure and certain, and it is absolutely safe. Absolutely safe. Held in his loving arms. Wow. The eternal God has stepped into time and space. And he says, I'll hold you, and I'll hold you tight. An anchor for the soul. Let's just pray together. Oh, Father, thank you so much for the promises of your word. Thank you so much that you have given us an anchor for this new year, for every time, for every moment, for every generation. And Lord, we pray that you would enable us to keep looking up, expecting every day the footfall of the Savior as he returns, not as a babe in a manger, but as an all-conquering king, king of kings and lord of lords. Lord, we bow in worship and we come with thanksgiving in your own dear name. Amen. Amen. Bless you. Amen. Amen. Thanks. Colin, what an encouragement from God's word this morning. Why don't you stand? We're going to sing a final song together. We're going to sing, In Christ Alone My Hope Is Found. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my soul. His cornerstone is solid ground, firm to the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still.
Lord, we do indeed thank you this morning that you are an anchor for each of our souls. We thank you, Jesus, that our home is in heaven, made possible because of your death and resurrection. Help us to live in light of that this year, I pray. May we keep looking up. Amen. Amen. So good to spend time with you this morning to worship with you. Just a reminder that next Sunday, we're back to two services. So 9.30 and 11.15, and we'd love you to join us. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 23. A final encouragement, peace to the brothers and sisters and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless you. Have a great week. Take care. God bless.